Good morning to all of you. Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Mr. Yunghua Cheng will defend his academic thesis entitled Generative Models Improve Radiomics Reproducibility and Performance in Low Dose Cities. May I invite you, Mr. Cheng, to present a summary of your studies and the conclusion of your thesis in the next 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Dear members of Corona, supervisors, dear family, friends, and colleagues, thank you for being here online today and for your interest in my doctoral research, which I will summarize in the next 15 minutes with the title, Generator Model Improve Radiomics Reproducibility and Performance in Low Dose ATs. Here, let's go. Developing medical imaging methods provide opportunities to assess the characteristic of human tissues not invasively and continuously. This is diagnosis and treatment planning based on medical imaging is common in modern medicine. However, humans are assessed the discrimination and computation ability, reduce uh, reproducibility, reliability, and accuracy of quality of disease diagnosis. Computer-added diagnosis systems can overcome the mentioned shortcoming due to computers' strong computation ability. CD systems derived directly from medical image have poor generalization performance due to the high dimension of medical image and the limited volume of labeled data. Therefore, fixtures which represent inform information with, uh, with, um, with Therefore, fixtures which represent information with, uh, of image with much lower dimension are needed. Two kinds of typical fixtures are widely used in recent CD systems, Radiomax and D fixtures. Radiomax is a popular framework due to its high interpretability and re-established mathematician definition. Radiomax fixtures can be classified into several categories, intensity relative fixtures, shape relative fixtures, texture relative fixtures, and other fixtures. Radiomic fixtures have been applied for multiple clinic applications in ecological, such as tumor phenotype decoding, cancer survival prognostic, diagnostic, or suspect tissues. Moreover, radiomic fixtures have shown effective for applications in most clinic imaging modality, such as CT, MR, PET. Statistic data shows that CT is one of major examinations in clinic practice. Around 1.3 million CT scans were collected in Netherlands in 2015. Extracting CT radiomics has big potential to take part in clinic practice for decision support. Due to long-term risk posed by radiation exposure, low-dose CTs have become popular. More and more researchers studied to calculate radiomic fixtures based on low-dose CTs in clinic practice. And today's presentation will focus on radiomics for low dose ATs. Although significant progress have been made in low dose AT radiomics, reproducibility and performance of low dose AT radiomics have been challenged during high node power in the image and the low reliability of fixtures for noisy images. Most basic are the trade off of low radiation exposure in low dose AT images, how noise is present in those images. Noise will decrease the image texture and the reproducibility of radiomic fixtures. Purpose of this thesis is improving the reproducibility of low dose CT radiomics and its performance in clinical applications. One potential solution worth exploring for this question is denoising the image before extracting radiomic fixtures. A series of studies shows that generative model achieves sort of performance in low dose CT denoising, at least. When I started this project in the beginning of 2020, generator model is the best models for low dose CT denoising. Generator models are a category of machine learning model designed to capture the underlying possibility distribution of a given data set, enable them to generate new data samples that resemble the original data. And the main content of this presentation focuses on using generator model in pro low dose CT radar max reproducibility, and performance. Outline of this thesis is shown as follow. I will show in uh, as parametric methods for denoising training data are needed for establishing generator model. Uh, 
Due to the missing of reappeared low-dose, high-dose CT dataset, generator model trained based on the simulated paired data or real unpaired data in this thesis. And the trained model applied into low-dose CTs to show the improvement of RADIMX reproducibility and performance on multiple applications. And the first part of content of this thesis will be discussed in chapter 3, 5, Six. And uh, before entering the story of radiomic enhancement, this thesis investigates some details about the structure of generator model for low dose CT denoising and apply the low dose CT radiomics into a new application, which will be discussed in the following chapter. The left part of content of the thesis will be discussed in chapter two and four. In chapter two, we discuss something about encoder decor network. Encoder decoder network is a type of neural network architecture that known to map input simple to output simple. It is an important architecture of generator in generator model for low dose CT denoising. And shortcuts are important for semantic transform from encoder to decoder. However, some semantics are noise in denoising task. In this research chapter, we investigate the benefit of shortcut in encoder decoder network for CT denoising. As shown in the methods section, two, in, two encoder decoder network architecture are increased into these studies. Network are tested in two data sets with different noise level, and shortcuts are progressively removed from shallow to deep and deep to shallow. Here are the experimental results of one architecture in one data set. Results showing that over half shortcuts are necessary for low dose CT denoising. However, network should keep spear in some degree during network design, and deeper shortcuts have higher priority to be removed in keep spear connection. The results of this chapter may provide some guidelines for better general model design in following chapter. And before entering the story of using general model in pro low dose CT radio max performance, in chapter four, we apply low dose CT radio max into a new application, and which, which will be discussed in the following chapter. The object of this application is to develop a lung cancer classification model at patient level from multiple exam nodes without the need to have the basic active funding reported at level of each individual node. As shown in the methods section, lung cancer classification is regarded as multiple instance learning problem here. In multiple instance binary classification, a bag will be labeled negative if all instances in it are negative. And in our case, it means no dish in the, P, in, uh, in the person sorry, are benign. On the other hand, a bag is labeled positive if there are at least one instance in it which is positive. In our applications, it means at least one no dish in this patient are malignant. CT radiomics are used by maker to extract information from each node, and deep attention based multiple instance learning is used as a classification algorithm for this classification task. Result of a comparison study between the proposed methods with other multiple instance learning methods and example of attention weight for decision support are shown as result section. Result showing that Proposed methods can achieve the SOTA performance in lung cancer classification model compared with uh, in, uh, lung cancer classification task compared with other multiple instance learning methods. And introduced attention mechanics can increase the interpretability of the result. And chapter three investigates the possibility of using generative model in pro CT radiomics. Two typical generative model, conditional generative adversarial network and encoder decoder network are included as test model. Generative adversarial network, GAMS, is a machine learning framework consisting of generator and discriminator network that compete against each other. And the generator trying to generate realistic data and the discriminator trying to generate realistic, uh, and the discriminator aiming to uh, distinguish between real and generated data. As mentioned in chapter two, encoder decoder network can be used as a generator in GAMS. And the included model in this chapter need a paired low dose, four dose data set for model training. However, collecting those data sets are expensive and time consuming. 
I'll show you in the methods section. Model training in this chapter based on paired simulated data and applied into the simulated and real load OCTs to show the improvement of radar max reproducibility. In this chapter, we only investigate, investigate the possibility of uh, uh, improved reproducibility. Result of radar max reproducibility improvement in one real load OCT data set is shown as result section. The result shows that denoising based on encoder decoder network and conditional gum can be used to improve the reproducibility of radar max pictures, which calculated from noisy images, and denoising seems to be a useful pre processing step for low dose CT radiomic extraction. Finally, this is the first study to improve the reproducibility of radiomic pictures, which calculated on low dose CTs by using the joint model. To comprehensively investigate the improvement of enhanced radiomic input locations, pre trained generative model, which present in Chapter 3, applied into uh, multiple real low dose CT datasets without fine turn. And uh, uh, radiomic fixtures are extracted from the denoid CT images and applied into multiple radiomic related locations. Tumor pretreatment, sweat production, and deep attention based on multiple instance learning for lung cancer diagnosis, which present in Chapter 4. The results show that uh, result of performance improvement of uh, uh, two mentioned locations are shown as result section. The results show that paired simulation data trained model can improve low dose CT radiomax performance. Result of chapter three and five showing that simulation data trained model can improve low dose CT radiomax reproducibility and performance. To investigate the possibility of using unpaired real low dose CT data sets uh, to uh, establish a uh, network and using the trained model to enhance radiomic reproducibility and performance. Circle gun is adopted as a testing model in chapter six. As shown in the methods section, circle gun is trained based on unpaired real data set and paired simulated data set for comparison study with previous mentioned encoder decoder network and conditional gun. The trained model applied to uh, load CT images to test the improvement of radiomics. Result about the improvement of radiomix reproducibility and performance in pretreatment several production task is shown as follow. The results show that circle gun trained on both simulated and real data can improve radiomix reproducibility and performance in low dose ATs, and it achieved a similar result compared with simulation data trained conditional gun and encoder decoder network. And based on the based on the Mentioned result, zero consolation of the thesis can be funded. Firstly, not all shortcuts are beneficial for CT denoising. Shortcuts should keep, should keep spear in some degree during network design. Secondly, radiomix and deep attention based in multiple instance learning can achieve good performance in lung cancer diagnosis at patient level with higher interpretability. And generator model trained on both simulated and real data can improve radiomix reproducibility and performance in low dose ATs. And the denoising seems to be a useful pre processing step for low dose CT radiomic extraction. That's all my today's presentation. Thanks for your attention. I give back the control to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Candidate, uh, for your presentation. You are right in time, although I was a little bit worried. I thought there's so many data in your slides, but you were on time. And that gives us the opportunity now to start officially your dis the discussion with the, with the opponents. And the opposition will be opened by the chairman of your assessment committee, Professor Wilberger. He is affiliated with the department of, as chair of the Department of Radiology here at Maastricht University. And I got, and I'd like to give him the opportunity to start the discussion. Thank you, Prorector. Mr. Candidate, thank you very much for sharing new insights into models to improve radiomics, reproducibility, and performance in Lodos CT, and um, it was a pleasure reading your manuscript, and now we start the discussion. But before doing that, I'd li also like to give the compliments to your supervisory team. So one, on one of your slides, you actually showed that Alara makes Lodos CT popular in practice. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that statement? Yeah. 
Thanks for a uh, headache than the opponent. Thanks for your questions. Yeah, uh, according to the uh, law as reasonable practice uh, principle, which from the, uh, uh, I, I don't know, but, but uh, according to the regulations, I think when we do examinations for the patient, if, if possible, uh, low radiations means uh, more health for the patient if it is that practicable. That's why I think uh, we should do the this research in the local city radar in the local cities. Okay, you're a biomedical engineer. I'm a clinical doctor, so I'm a radiologist. So when do we use low dose CTs in clinical practice? Do you have any ideas on that? Uh, thanks for your questions. Uh, based on my understandings, I think the low dose CTs mainly used in the uh, patient skimming mm -hmm. and uh, the disease uh, monitoring. In that case, uh, if we can do some uh, jobs to improve the quality of the image, the uh, uh, the performance of radiomics, it means we can uh, improve the accuracy of uh, computer added diagnosis. It can help to the uh, early diagnosis and uh, can provide more opportunities to uh, the patient to survivors. That's my opinion. Okay, so how can radiomics in that respect and you also mentioned computer assisted diagnosis CAD in that respect how will this probably influence or even change our profession and how we work in the clinical settings with these data yeah just like the title of a computer added diagnosis systems it's just uh, added the diagnosis it just provide advice to the doctors you know uh, doctors are always uh, busy and these things have limited uh, energy to skim all uh, slides uh, all city slides slide by slide and maybe our computer added diagnosis systems which based on radiomics or defectures can save some time for the doctors and uh, uh, provide the uh, first uh, advice to for the patient. I mean, if uh, if it is a, a positive uh, case, it we can provide the doctors. A, or maybe you can uh, do more examinations for the patient, and uh, yeah, that's I think the means of uh, computer added diagnosis systems for the uh, doctors for the uh, medical physics. Okay, thank you. You're right, we're very busy, but I think every one of us is quite busy in the current times. The major problem, or let's put it this way, we see is a standing, inc we see an increase in workload in numbers of exams, but also in data per exam. And if we do early detection, I would rather call it then screening, for instance, in lung cancer detection, it would help us a lot if we could get rid of the normals. So let's say if you could help us provide an algorithm where we do not need to spend too much attention to the normal CTs or whatever MRs or PETs, that would be very helpful. Could you help us in that respect? Thanks for your questions. Yes, uh, false positive is really uh, common things in the normal. Uh, in but excuse in me, false positive is not my major concern if there's just a few false positives. I would be rather, uh, well, not that much in favor of false negatives. <laughs> uh, yeah, false negatives are also, uh, actually, I think the deadly questions for the computer added diagnosis system. So at this moment, the, uh, basically all my understandings about computer added diagnosis systems, they are really serious when they fit the uh, negative patient. Mm -hmm. That's why they are more for positive reports from the computer added diagnosis systems. They have no responsibilities to take the for negative, so reported them more for positive to the doctors. Well, false positives in a 
certain bandwidth is not that much of a problem we can correct that yeah but if we do not read the normals anymore and there are some disease in this patch of normals then i would have a problem right but you yeah. can help us with that yeah okay so <laughs> i i i think the uh systems need to develop the step by step uh -huh. and it make it by make sure that by regulations by the government and uh, uh based on my understanding is that at this moment computer added diagnosis systems willing to report more uh for positive rather than more for negative case perfect thank you so i have if i may one more question so we are discussing low dose ct in your thesis you also uh, speak about full dose and also high dose what is the definition of low full and high thanks for your questions um <laughs> i'm sorry i make some mistakes about the definition of uh, low high and uh, full uh, actually there are some difference among different chapters different manuscripts in my thesis actually in here the full dose uh, CTs in here is 400 milliampere seconds, and uh, the low dose is means 50 uh, milliampere seconds for CTs in uh, in my CTs uh, the definition, and uh, it's just my personal uh, standard to define full dose or uh, low dose. Actually, uh, it's mainly because uh, when I start this project. Uh, the uh, the raw data extracted from the uh, a data set from our lab, and uh, in that uh, data set, the most high quality images are exam uh, are imaging in 400 milliampere seconds, and uh, on another uh, open um, challenge for low dose CT denoising task, uh, the low dose uh, CTs defined by 50 and uh, 50 milliampere second in that uh, challenges. So I choose the uh, 50 milliampere seconds mm -hmm. as the low dose CT and 400 uh, milliampere second as uh, uh, high dose CT and full dose CTs. There are some, uh, you know, some mistakes between different chapters. I code high dose or full dose, but these I wouldn't call that mistakes because that's fully okay if you if you use different terms for that. But I think okay, I have to stop. I see. Um, I can handle the word. I'm very fine. Thank you so much, and I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't know that my body language was so clear, <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. Uh, we do have to indeed continue with the opposition. The opposition will now followed by Professor van der Berg. For the people in the audience, he will be online, the, the, this second uh, opponent. He is, uh, re he is related to the Department of Computational Imaging at the University Medical Center in Utrecht, and I would like to thank him that he joins online from Utrecht. Professor van den Berg, I give you the word. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and of course, I would have liked to be there uh, physically. That's uh, wonderful, but I have... Uh, busy day, uh, afternoon, other programs. So it was not possible for me, but uh, still I'm very happy I can be here, dear candidate. Uh, looking forward to, uh, to this uh, scientific discussion. First of all, I like, would like to congratulate you, uh, congratulate you with the thesis and like to involve your promoter team in that as well. Um, my first question uh, relates to, uh, to chapter two. Uh, here you present two different uh, denoising networks. Uh, one is a, as a fully connected, uh, uh, well, you call it fully connected uh, uh, neural network. The other one is more like the UNet uh, network. Uh, you test them for denoising purposes, and uh, you also look at the, uh, uh, the impact of uh, of a connection of removing connections. And you you have different strategies. You go from shallow to deep, deep to shallow. And before we go into the, in, in my overall questions, I, I had a, a question on the results. So maybe if this is just, uh, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on that. What are your findings? Because you mentioned 
on page, I think it was 34, that initially you stated that the, what you call the fully connected network achieved the best average performance. And then later you state that the, the sparsely connected networks outperform the fully connected networks. And you do that based on uh, on uh, the on uh, statistical significance testing. And so I had a bit difficulty following that section. Could you just explain it to me a bit more in detail and also uh, um, and maybe explain uh, the origins of uh, your findings in the sense that why certain things appear? Hi, Lake, then the opponent. Thanks for your questions. Uh, I'm not sure I can get your question 100%. Uh, based on my own thinking, you are asked about why the uh, spear connection network can receive a better result compared with, compared with full connected network. Uh, if that question, my answer is um, the shortcut in encoder decoder network is transform the semantic information from encoder to decoder. The semantic things actually in, um, basically included the noise of uh, uh, of the information of, of the images. You know the 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 information transformed from the encoder to decoder is uh, uh, yeah yeah high <coughs> to make the result uh, more clear, more sharp. But the sharp information in the denoising task it means the noise. You deliver the noise to the to your output. It it's just not the right thing. That's why I think not all shortcuts are helpful for denoising task in uh, uh, in local cities. And there, so you mentioned that the deep connections they uh, pass on the noise, while the shallow connections give more the spatial semantic or contextual information that helps the denoising is that what you're stating or because i think that's what you found right it's 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 it's, it's beneficial to keep the shallow connections but you can remove the deep connections yeah based on the consolution of my thesis i uh, reported that the deeper shortcuts have higher priority to be removed in keep spare connection because i think that Mainly, the deep shortcut provides the more content information of the image. I mean, the uh, the uh, uh, basic content information. Actually, most of the, uh, the uh, most of the, uh, those things are transformed by the lowest shortcut to the encoders. And in that case, they are things not so important for these tasks compared with. Uh, compared with the shallow, uh, shallow shortcuts, that might. Okay. Uh, that's clear. That's clear. This addition that helps me a lot. Thank you for that. Um, now I would like to uh, uh, actually discuss uh, whether it's always a good idea to use the denoising as you did. This is a separate denoising uh, network, right? And uh, we know low OCT suffers from uh, noise uh, issues. Uh, what you also see now is that in modern CT reconstructions, the denoising is done in a reconstruction. That's either uh, through an iterative scheme where they uh, include regularization like total variation, or you see you saw now more and more deep learning type of uh, reconstructions uh, appearing where they do, for instance, on-road optimization where the regularization is actually learned. Um, so looking at this for your particular application, would it still be beneficial to do this denoising the way you did with a separate noise in the network? Or would it be better to include it in the reconstruction? And would it, if so, would it have an impact on your results? So would it be a good idea for radiomics? Sorry, would you mind pardon your questions? I can't get the Kirk information. Okay, so in, in Modern CT reconstructions, they they uh, they they do a lot of regularization, right? In regularization, you change the the, the signal uh, uh, signature, right? So noise is is is, is uh, 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 noise is reduced in that sense. Will have an effect on 
the radiomic features which you derive from that. Um, so the denoising strategies you use, they assume that I think the CTs are just reconstructed by standard, more classical reconstructions, or could they also work for uh, modern reconstructions where in the reconstruction, they apply regularizations uh, to suppress noise? Uh, the, uh, I, thanks for your questions. Yes, uh, I think uh, except the denoise the tasks, there are also many other methods can improve the result. I, but uh, I have limited the knowledge about that, uh, uh, that domain direction. Sorry for your questions. Uh, so, sorry, I can't provide more information about your question. Sorry for that. Uh, then I would like to shift gears so if I have uh, two or three more minutes. You have one more minute. Uh, I, I wonder about, uh, I have a short question on the on, on page uh, on chapter six, where you really showed that the, uh, the denoising really helps in the, uh, in the uh, uh, reproducibility of the features. This is for classical radiomics, right? But if you do deep learning based radiomics where you learn the features, would you also think that uh, your strategy would work or would it be better to do that really end to end where the denoising will be part of the, the learning to go directly from the low dosities to the features? Um, thanks for your questions. Yes, deep radiomics is also a hot research topic at this moment. I also do some investigation about these questions. And basic, for your questions, I think, based on my understanding, my choice is yes, the noise is still helpful for the deep radiomics. Okay. Yeah, Is that's... I think uh, it's by uh, maybe by the results rather than the architectures. I mean, yeah, it's just a kind of a normalizations. Normalizations can be work for uh, deep radiomics and radiomics. Both of them are worked. Thank you very much. Then, then the opposition will be continued by Professor Van Ginneken. He is appointed and affiliated with the Department of Medical Image Analysis of the Radboud UMC, and I would like to thank him that he joins this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Candidate, I, I read your thesis with, uh, with great pleasure. You did an impressive amount of work. Um, I would like to discuss a few things with you, and I would like to start with uh, what I was a bit surprised about. You work with 3D data in your whole thesis but it seems that you're always using 2D deep learning methods for your denoising. Um, why is that? And have you also considered to use 3D methods? Hi, Lick, Dan, opponent. Thanks for your questions. Um, yes, um, when I started this project, the GPU resources for me is limited. The memory of my uh, GPU uh, platform only uh, 60 G, G bit. In that case, to train the large size of three dimension uh, models, it seems uh, uh, out of memory and uh, unacceptable for me at that moment. And uh, yes, some studies reported that uh, for the uh, image translation task, three dimension models will be better than 2D dimensions. Uh, but in this thesis, uh, it's a flexibility study, and uh, I think uh, the performance of a three, a two D dimension denoising still uh, uh, acceptable, and the uh, data is easy to access and uh, to proceeding, and easy to train and uh, faster to receive the uh, result. And uh, yes, I agree with that. Uh, in the following. Researchers, I think it may be better to uh, transform the three-dimension uh, deep learning models. Great, yeah, I understand your answer, and uh, I, I agree with what with what you say. Now, you have a 
really focused on the low dose aspect of the data. Eh? Try to improve or reduce the noise with your pre-processing. But there are a lot of other variations. If you, would, if you would develop a method which would process scans from many different sites, many different CT uh, machines, there, there's a lot of variation in the reconstruction kernel that uh, people use, the slice thickness, the, the resolution. Um, do you foresee that you would have to make other networks to normalize that as well? Or could that be done in one approach? Because it could become impractical if you have to do a lot of pre-processing. Thanks for your questions. Uh, actually, for my research in chapter two, three, four, five, they are training based on the simulated data because uh, the paired low-dose, high-dose data set is unavoidable for me. However, if you want to investigate the chapter six of my thesis, I start to train the models with the real data set. In that case, you will find the uh, real data trained model. It's not a standard data set, but you will find, in some case, the performance of uh, real data trained model can improve the performance even better than standard data trained models. I think this phenomenon may be caused by the uh, network reduce the effect of noise uh, effect, and then other parameters also be reduced. I mean, the various also be reduced. I mean, the, as you mentioned, the uh, reconstruction curve, the thickness between image layers. And uh, my answer for your question is that generation, uh, at least CircleGum have the abilities to reduce the uh, in, uh, the effect of uh, multiple parameters at once if you choose the a good uh, standard real data set. I mean, yeah, in that case, and uh, the different case from different domains and feed to the network. I think uh, CircleGon have the ability to do that job, at, to, uh, to do this normalization at once. That, 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 it, sounds, that sounds very promising, if that would work. And, and uh, I would agree with you that it would be ideal to use one network to normalize the data. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned in your propositions, uh, both proposition three and eight, that you think that low dose CT radiomics can play a role in lung cancer screening. It could reduce uh, mortality due to lung cancer screening. Um, how exactly would you foresee a product that will be used in lung cancer screening um, wh what should it do? Should it just predict the malignancy of a nodule? Because you also had a chapter on at the patient level, but then you have no idea which areas of the image you need to analyze. Can you explain to me how a product would, uh, would look like, what it, would, what it should address to be helpful in lung cancer screening? Uh, thanks for your questions. I think the, uh, uh, the means of... Uh, um, the value of uh, radiomix in uh, low dose CTs is it, it mainly focused on early detection, early diagnosis. I mean, in a scheming uh, in the scheming uh, situation, uh, maybe you know, uh, I'm not so sure, but will be much patients in at once, and uh, doctors maybe have no energy to focus on. Uh, small nodules uh, with, I mean, serious, uh, r really many, uh, really many uh, images, and I think the uh, the value of uh, uh, low dose CT radiomix to reduce the uh, to re to help the patient and doctor is that early detection and early diagnosis. But. In all your studies, you've assumed that you know the locations of nodules to be analyzed by your system. Do you think your radiomic system should also do nodule detection then? Or uh, just focus on the classification of nodules? Yeah, thanks for your questions. Based on my thesis, it's uh, uh, mainly focused on uh, classification. So the nodules need to be uh, detected by the uh, doctors or by the other 
uh, automatic uh, softwares. Uh, in my thesis, I am focused on the uh, classification, but uh, I, as I mentioned, that the radiomics also can be used to detections and uh, uh, yeah. Okay, I uh, thank you very much for the answers and I give thank the word you. back to the prorector. Thank you very much. The opposition now will be continued by another member of the assessment committee, Dr. Van Elbt. He is affiliated with the Department of Radiation Oncology at this university and I'd like to give him the word. Thank you very much, dear prorector. Dear candidate, first of all, my congratulations um, for finalizing this thesis, coming from abroad and then within the four years finishing such a piece of work. It's actually a challenge uh, for you that you have overcome and you are going to show that uh, today. I do have a question, a few questions related to your work. Um, so actually with the title, you, you want to improve the reproducibility and the performance um, of the models. And to follow up a little bit on Professor van der Berg's question, in chapter four, you quantify actually the performance, where you state that you start off with an AUC for predicting survival from 0.52 and then I was very interested in your thesis and all the work you did. And then I was a bit disappointed that you only reached 0.54 or 0.58 in terms of AUC. Um, what is your comment about that, dear candidate? Hi, Lake Dan opponent. Thanks for your questions. Yes, the main purpose of the thesis is improve the uh, radiomics reproducibility and the performance in low dose CTs. As you can see, the original, uh, the original AUC of uh, a radiomics in uh, this task is 0 0.54, uh, and it, it, it improved to 0 0.58. Uh, I think it still met the uh, topic of this thesis. And uh, regarding the low AUC for the uh, radiomic-based uh, uh, survival pr production task, uh, I need to mention that for survival, ta uh, survival production task, the AUC and the uh, CI index were not so high by uh, compared with classification uh, tasks because you know you could not uh, product a patient survivor or uh, or dies based on images because there are various. Uh, parameters in all uh, in the real world in the real day uh, in the real life you know some guys maybe which parameters would you then maybe a car accident maybe you, you know in the real world there are many other things so in the survival production task the AUC we are not we are not too high it will less than 0 0.7 in most of the studies uh, I have to admit that in my thesis, 0 0.58 is low, but it still meets my topic. Generator model improves the performance of radiomics. Thank you very much. Um, I follow your reasoning, and indeed, other factors like clinical factors or gene mutation statuses might actually influence the outcome prediction um, more, but it's at least good that we take on all the boxes to, to, to make this promise. Uh, I have some technical questions. So. Um, you introduced noise in the sinogram space in chapter two and three. Mm -hmm. Could you explain me a little bit the process, how you came from the original images into your simulated images? Uh, yeah, thanks for your questions. In my practice of uh, uh, get the simulation data, I uh, insert the date, uh, the noise in the Latin domain of CT imaging in the sinogram of data. Uh, some studies will insert the noise in the image domain. I think it's uh, unlike the real world CT images. The CT images, most of noise are uh, in, induced in the uh, signal collection domain, as that I mean. The, so I just insert the noise in the uh, Latin domain, in the sonogram sonog domain, and reconstructed the images from the uh, noise, the uh, Latin Latin domains. Of, of, of course, we need to using the uh, Latin transform, need to uh, transform, uh, transform the standard image using Latin transform to the Latin domain and adding the noise in the Latin domain of the 
data. I, I fully agree that you do it in the signing web space. I think that's the way to. But how do you get back from the signing web space back to the image domain then? Uh, by using the image reconstruction algorithms. Yes, it uh, it, it it can uh, introduce some uh, noise by the different uh, reconstruction algorithms, but. Uh, I removed that part of things by some, uh, I'm not so sure, but uh, it's be removed because it's a su simulation data, so source so removed yeah. had be, source noise has been removed. Yeah, a lot of the manufacturers put a lot of effort in, in uh, reconstruction methods that remove noise, um, switching away from filter back projection that we had quite some years ago with the radiant transform, et cetera, that you have uh, shown by using iterative reconstructions. Are you not worried that by your simple back projection method, you lose a lot of the power that you could have from your work in, in, in this respect. Uh, I'm worried actually a lot of times, but uh, <laughs> I just don't find out the better solutions for your mentioned questions. Yeah, no, it, it's a problem that the manufacturers don't open up their reconstruction yeah, algorithms yeah, and yeah. you had to suffer probably yeah, also yeah, from yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, I agree, but I just could not find a better solutions. For and then my questions. final last question, if I am allowed, um, a lot of your data and training was, um, for scientific purposes, that's fine, was built on rather old data sets from the TCIA archive, which are made on, on old scanners. What is your idea whether this method should be applied or could be applied on modern generation scanners, having iterative reconstruction or even the new photon counting CTs that are on the market? Would your model still be applicable if we go to the newer brand of CT? Um, scanners that are currently available, including their new reconstruction algorithms? Uh, thanks for your questions. I think the data, uh, including the data from the open access data set is that the, the advantage of uh, this action is can make more researchers can reproduct your results. That's the main purpose. I choose the data from the open access TCIA data set. And uh, I, I admit that if can using the uh, prevent uh, data, it will maybe better. But uh, the purpose of for me to choose the open access data set is make other researchers to reproduct my results. Thank you very much, dear candidate. I give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much. Now the opposition will be continued by Professor Breo. He is affiliated with the Department of Medical Image Analysis of the Technical University in Eindhoven. And I also thank him that he joins today. I'd like to give you the word. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidates, uh, first of all, my uh, congratulations to you and your supervisors for your very interesting thesis. Um, my first question is actually about the introduction, page 10 and 11. The last sentence, it starts on page 10, and you state domain knowledge is not necessary for deep learning based denoising methods. And I think I would like to challenge that statement. Um, I'm quite sure you can choose a network and you have, you have the proper training data, you can learn it to do something. But basically my question is, uh, what if you understand more about the physics of the noise or the physics of the signal that you want to denoise, could you not have used that to your advantage? And uh, recently, uh, the field of physics-informed or physics-based deep learning has become very active. So could you have used more physics-based deep learning to get an even better performance? Highly extended opponents, thanks for your questions. I agree with your questions is that it seems made it seems not uh, <laughs> it seems not a good uh, statement in these introductions. Yes, um, actually, when I write these sentences, mainly focus mainly want to discuss is about that the difference between the uh, traditional denoising methods and deep learning methods. I want to uh, inf I want to say that uh, deep learnings uh, have no. They didn't did not need the uh, uh, domain knowledge can finish the denoising task. But uh, when I look back to this uh, thesis, I agree with you that if we can plus the uh, domain knowledge, so as you mentioned, into the deep learning, I think it can improve the performance and uh, it can make the uh, models better. Yeah, I, I, I admit that it's uh, not a good statement. 
agree with you. Yeah. And, and then do you think you would like to include it either in the architecture or maybe the loss function or the way you do the training? Do you have ideas on that? Uh, uh, thanks for your questions. I agree with you. And uh, uh, during my uh, studies, I have limited uh, uh, experience, a uh, research experience in design the loose functions. So yeah, mm -hmm. I, you, you, as you know, uh, I agree with you that uh, consider the more things, I mean, introduce the more, uh, more terms, more informations into the loose functions, it can make the uh, performance Better. But as I mentioned, it's uh, flexibility studies. We need to make it uh, possible at first, and then improve its performance. And uh, I totally agree with your, your your statement. It can be better. Okay, thank you. Um, let's then move to page 25, where you state somewhere in the middle of the page, paired full doses and one quarter dose CT images uh, from 10 patients were provided to train a low-dose CT denoising network. And I wonder what this paired exactly means. So I understand that you have uh, a full dose and one quarter dose image per patient, but were those from different acquisitions or was the low dose derived from the high dose? Uh, highly extended opponents. Uh, you mentioned the data set is uh, open access data set from uh, uh, international challengers. Um, in that case, they provide uh, uh, a data set con uh, with 10 patients. In their, uh, in their practice, they regarded uh, uh, 50 milliampere second as a low dose CTs and the uh, 400 milliampere as four dose CTs. In my practice of this project, I, I think the low dose CT in there are uh, settings. It's not enough for my... Uh, yeah, that's not my question, I think. I want to know whether those are two acquisitions or one derived from the other. Because if it is two acquisitions, you may have misalignment between the images. So my question also is, were the images first properly aligned by registration techniques so that you can really use them as input uh, for deep learning? Because if not, you're doing something quite dangerous, I think. Uh, thanks for your question. Actually, the data set from AAPM is also a simulation data set. Ah, so simulated. Ah, okay. Simulation data set. Ah, okay. So no, no that, questions that, left. That answers either. the question. <laughs> then I directly move to my next it, uh, question. It's also a simulation data set. Yeah. Good. Uh, still chapter 2, page uh, 29 and 30, you speak about residual encoder, decoder, CNN. And if I look to the uh, figure 2.1, I basically see sort of two versions of a unit, and I don't see any residual branches. So why do you call this residual? Uh, thanks for your questions. Yes, I agree with your comments. They are actually, they are, both of them are type of uh, units. I agree with them. I agree with you. Yeah, so, but, so you, you took these uh, architectures and you directly tried to predict the denoised image from the input image. So you do not try to predict the noise itself. Yeah. Because if you would have predicted the noise, then you could sort of have subtracted it from the data, and then you can call it residual. But you predict the, no the denoised image directly. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> OK, good. Th then I understand. Then I personally think that you should not use the term residual. But yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's just terminology. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It's my first, uh, first jobs when I start the, these journals, so yeah. it's <laughs> It seems not so, 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 so good. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that. Is there time for another question, uh, Proactor? Yes, a short one. A short one. Um, still page, uh, chapter two, but actually it's a question related to uh, multiple chapters. Uh, in chapter two, you train with 45 epochs. Mm -hmm. Why do you choose a fixed number of epochs? I mean, normally you can try dur during the training to uh, look at how well the training does, eh? you can split the data in uh, training data, validation data, and then do the test afterwards, and basically stop when you see that the validation uh, becomes worse, uh, what we call early stopping. Why using a fixed number of epochs? Thanks for your questions. And uh, just as I mentioned, I, at that time, I'm just starting to my s studies in deep learning. So I found some, some literatures also stopped, uh, stopped the, at training at uh, uh, Better than uh, better than fifty epochs. 
So at that time, I just stopped it at 45 epochs because uh, at that time, uh, training is high with high price for our lab because it, at that time, we training models in the um, Amazon cloud. <laughs> it need a, it, it need more time and more money if you training more. So sure. receiver the result enough, so I just stopped. Okay, I thank you for your uh, answers and give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much. Then the opposition will be continued and basically closed by our last opponent, Dr. Sun. She is affiliated with the Department of Data Science at our university, and I'd like to give her the word, too. Thank you, Prorector. So uh, first, uh, congratulations to you and your supervisor team. And I really enjoy reading your thesis. And um, so my first question is in your um, discussion, so page 205. You mentioned that it is difficult to find the best architecture in hyperparameter setting for generative models. And my question is um, why it is difficult? Because I was reading your uh, uh, chapters from, for example, chapter three, four, five, six. You trained um, the models in um, epics in 25, 50, 70, 100, and uh, using similar parameters. So I wonder like, whether you actually explore the different combination of architectures and parameters, and you conclude it is difficult. Yeah. Highly extend the opponent. Thanks for your questions. Uh, I think the, uh, I make some mistakes about statement of uh, these pages. Uh, I mean the best architectures for and hyperparameter uh, hyper setting is, it means um, to find out the best uh, architectures for these uh, tasks. And uh, the hyperparameter, they are various in deep learning training. I mean, the curve, the training epochs, the uh, uh, learning rate. Um, the, I think there are some mistakes when I make statements in here because, uh, yeah, I stated that I found the best uh, models in chapter two, chapter, uh, chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, but uh, mention this point again here. Uh, I think there's some, 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 some mistakes, sorry for that. <laughs> um, and do you think like uh, when you find those best architecture or hyperparameters, does it, um, uh, is it dependent on your data set or tasks? Does it mean that ev every time when you have when we have a new data set, we need to find the best uh, parameters and architecture again? Uh, thanks for your questions. I think yes. And uh, to, in, in order to choose the best architectures, best models, I think some open challenges for uh, zero tasks is valuable to, to find out the best uh, uh, backbones, the, be the best networks. And uh, I agree with that. Uh, even some uh, SOTA network in other tasks, but it may be not the best performance in your data set because it uh, abears mm -hmm. from the data set. I agree with you that, yeah, yeah. But also the uh, open challenges, international challenges can uh, slow this question in some degrees because it's uh, uh, equal compassion, mm -hmm. you know, the, Sync training data, sync test data, and uh, but but those uh, those tasks it seems even not so so fair because you know yeah it's just also a bias the data set but uh, in some degrees it can slow these questions. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, my next question is related to your discussion on the barriers related to the implementation. You mentioned two points. One is our uh, medical doctors and the clinical uh, researchers have a limited coding skills. Second one is massive uh, computational resources in, for example, hospitals are limited to train those models. I actually want to ask like from human perspective, from uh, clinicians or uh, doctors from their perspective, how much trust or confidence do they have on your model? Because you mentioned that uh, we, don't need, uh, we, we don't need that much domain experts in this uh, model, but then what, how much they can accept your model in this stage? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your questions. I think that's why the clinical trials is important. You know, the, the models, 
the methods, the innovations are maybe root from the technical guys, and they want to uh, the doctors to use. But I think the clinical trials is important, and the uh, government regulation also can provide some guidelines to make the uh, product from technical guys to make beliefs to the doctors. Clinical trials is the is the first step, and the government need to make sure this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my answer. Do you think like involving them at early stage, like when we start building this model, we already consult the uh, clinical experts? Does it increase the chance that they trust more and confident about the model more? Uh, thanks for your questions. I agree with you. It uh, at this moment the. Like, uh, computer aided diagnosis systems, especially for the deep learning based computer aided diagnosis systems, it's still in the early stages. But based on my knowledge, uh, there are zero software receiver the lessons from government in China. For example, for the nodules detection, some uh, solutions receiver the lessons. And uh, yes, it's early stage, but we are going. Mr. Candidate, you are allowed to finish your answer if you want. You don't have to. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, it's in the early stage, but we are closed. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Candidate. The time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will now withdraw, and we're going to discuss not so much the quality of your thesis, because that has been already decided, but particularly the way you have defended your thesis this morning. I requested you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in about 10, 12 minutes. Thank you very much. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose bad branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep part because we're taking off Hit the mileage,
No place like home If this question's how you've got Go the extra mile and die mm-hmm. Long road to south side mm-hmm. Ten miles in my rearview mirror I know what it felt like mm-hmm. My goal's only getting clearer East side to the west side mm-hmm. No place like home
Dear Mr. Chen, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and also in addition the way you have defended your thesis in the last hour. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you officially the degree of doctor. Professor Decker is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university customs. And therefore, I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. But before I do that, you have to make me a promise. And that is the following. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principle of scientific integrity at all times? to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. Then, by the authority vested in us by law, and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Yun Hua Chen, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. And as evidence of this, I now present you with a degree, certificates signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of our university. Thank you. Dear members of the Corona, ladies and gentlemen, today we gather here to recognize and commend an exceptional PhD student who has consistently demonstrated remarkable dedication, enthusiasm for scientific research, a helpful nature, and a genuine care for his friends. It is my privilege to present a laudatio for Junhua. Junhua has exemplified the qualities that define a successful researcher. He has consistently displayed strong work ethic, investing his time and energy into his research endeavors. His commitment to his research uh, has been unwavering, and as we have seen today, his efforts have yielded commendable results. Through his tireless work, he has shown a deep passion for advancing knowledge and pushing the boundaries of deep learning radiomics and AI in general applied to healthcare, producing one manuscript after the next. In addition to his education, Junhua's enthusiasm for scientific research is truly inspiring. He approaches his work with infectious energy, motivating others to strive for excellence. His enthusiasm is a driving force, fueling his own pursuit of knowledge and inspiring those around him to embrace the joy of discovery. Notably, Junhua's generosity and willingness to help others have left a lasting impression. He readily offers his assistance and support to colleagues going above and beyond to ensure the success of those around him. Soon after he arrived, for example, he shared the tea prepared by his father, as well as offering his cooking skills to prepare lunch for others. Beyond his academic achievements, Junhua has also demonstrated a genuine care for his friends. He has shown empathy and compassion towards others. His friends can rely on him for guidance and support, 
knowing that he has steadfast ally in both personal and academic endeavors. We all know how difficult it is to do a PhD, but especially if you're doing it on the other end of the world in a language that's completely different to your own. Add to that a one in a century pandemic, and you can imagine how difficult that must have been for Junwa, and yet he managed to do it before these uh, four years. In conclusion, it is with great admiration and respect that we honor this exceptional PhD student. His hard work, enthusiasm, willingness to help others, and genuine care for his friends are qualities that deserve recognition. He serves as a role model for aspiring researchers, embodying the values that contribute to a thriving scientific community. To Junoa, congratulations on your well-deserved recognition. Your dedication, enthusiasm, help, helpfulness, and caring nature are a testament to your character and the positive impact you have on others. May your future endeavors be filled with success and fulfillment as you continue to make significant contributions to the world of research. Thank you, Inigo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Dear Dr. Cheng, how does that feel? Good? Uh, yeah, actually, for this moment, <laughs> I'm working for 23 years since uh, seven years old children now. Uh, long journals as a student, actually. In, in Netherlands, a PhD student is a job, but in all traditions, a PhD student is still a student. Uh, 23 years long journals as a student. Today is my final days. I'm really happy. Okay. <laughs> thank well, you, thank you, thank you for all of you. Well, I would also, I would also like to congratulate you on behalf of Master University, of our Board of Deans, and I would like to uh, also congratulate your promotion team, who really guided you over the last four years. Uh, well, I say three and a half years, not four years, because you started September 1st, 2019. And I would also like to congratulate you that you finished on time, because uh, uh, not many CSC, but in general PhD students, can finish on time, but also with this impressive number of publications. I must really congratulate you. I checked that. You had almost six publications as first author, and you had several others which are still coming up or finishing a lot. So you really did a great job, and I would like to, and I would like to mention that to the other students in the audience here, it's a very good example the way we like to see students, and I do hope to see you in the next months or years to come, also presenting your thesis over here. I also would like to thank the members of the of the Corona who indeed took the time to come here, to be online, it basically that's also important, and to ask questions uh, to you. And by that, I think it's, you did a great job. I also would like to congratulate your family. I know they are online, they are looking now somewhere in China maybe, and it's been recorded, and I would like to say you did a great job. By that, I would like to close officially this ceremony, and I'm using my hammer for this, people haven't seen it, it's right here. And by that, officially, I close this ceremony. Thank you very much. How do we... Audience doesn't have to wait for their coffee, tea, beer or wine, because that's already been served now in the rafter, and we're going to meet there in about uh, five to ten minutes from now, and you already can.